Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring today's video. If you don't already know, Skillshare offers thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people on topics including illustration, design, photography, video, and more. You can explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in your creativity. If you enjoy my videos, then you will enjoy the class Writing for Expression, How to Make Your Words More Artful and Lyrical by Hanif Abdurahib. A great thing about a Skillshare membership is that Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, meaning that there are no ads and they're always launching new premium classes. So you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. So go on, do something today that you couldn't do yesterday with short classes designed for real life. The first 1,000 people who use the link in my description will receive a free one month trial to Skillshare Premium. So thanks again to Skillshare for collaborating with us and now on to the video. Hi, welcome to Yobi's Home and to another installment of my Dutch true crime series. If I sound a little bit strange, that is because I am going through an orthodontic treatment, I am straightening my teeth, um, and I sound a little bit funny, but we're gonna ignore that. Now this story is full of twists and turns, so get ready for a wild ride. It's also long, so grab a drink, get comfy, and if that sounds good to you, then why don't you come on in, put on your detective hat and stay a while. Let's solve some crimes together. Now to tell you Richard's story, we have to go back in time and tell you about his mother, Maria Vogelauer. Now personally, I find this part of the story the most fascinating, so we will spend a lot of this video on Richard's background and on his childhood. Maria, an Austrian girl, she arrived to the Netherlands sometime between World War I and World War II. She came to work as a maid for a very wealthy Dutch family. Now, Maria, she is not only beautiful, she is stunning. In the documents that I read, they all mentioned just how gorgeous she was, that she's so sensual, that she made all the men's hearts run wild. And as such, Maria doesn't stay single for long. She meets Jacob Klinghammer, a greengrocer who sells his fruit and vegetable door to door, and they meet at the house where Maria is working as a maid. They quickly fall in love and get married. Now Maria and Jacob, they have three sons, the youngest being Richard, who was born on March 15, 1937. And while Jacob is completely in love and enamored with Maria, she doesn't feel quite the same way. Maria has many affairs with different men and Jacob knows and even accepts this. And he even knows that his youngest child, Richard, isn't biologically his. Um, and it seems that Richard is actually the biological son of a village constable. But none of this matters to Jacob who completely accepts Richard as his own child and treats him no differently than his other two biological children. However, by the time that Richard is three years old, his parents' marriage has completely deteriorated and they get divorced. For whatever reason, and it wasn't clear in the documents that I was referencing, Jacob gets custody of the two older boys while Maria gets custody of three-year-old Richard. Now, Maria and Richard, they live in Amsterdam throughout World War II, during which time Maria is extremely friendly with the German soldiers, if you know what I mean. Um, and this does not go unnoticed by Dutch people. Now, although Maria has custody of Richard, she doesn't actually want him. So she decides to send Richard to her brother's farm in Austria. And things are going well for Richard there. Uh, and eventually in 1945, Austria is liberated from the Nazis. And that should be a happy moment, right? Well, sadly, it isn't, and it turns into one of the most traumatic days in eight-year-old Richard's life up until that point. You see, shortly after that town was liberated, Richard witnesses his uncle being imprisoned and his aunt raped. He also sees many, many villagers murdered that day. Now, it, again, it wasn't clear to me in the documents why Richard's Austrian family and their village is attacked in this way. 
There were some references to the villagers uh, employing Polish workers, but I couldn't really find more details about exactly why. But we do know that this happened. So after this horrific attack in Austria, Richard is sent back to his mother in Amsterdam. But life continues to be difficult because his mother was also then imprisoned for her friendships and relationships with SS officers during World War II. And as punishment for fraternizing with the enemy, Maria's head is shaved off at one of Amsterdam's ugly carnivals. Let's take a small detour in our story and discuss ugly carnivals. Have you heard about those before? I hadn't up until researching this story. Throughout history, women have been shamed and punished for various like bad behavior by having their heads shaved publicly. And this practice continued after World War II, and any time that after a city or town was liberated following the war, people would go out and find so-called Nazi conspirators, um, typically women in need of shaming. And after their heads were shaved, these women would be paraded through the streets, occasionally stripped, or covered in tar, or painted with swastikas, or other fucked up stuff. Now that was a lot, so let's take a small commercial break as the palate cleanser. Now back to Richard's childhood. After Richard's mother was released from prison, she too was shamed at an ugly carnival. Now can you just imagine the trauma that nine-year-old Richard went through? Like seeing his mother jailed and then shamed like that? Ugh, like ugh. Anyway, Maria eventually takes up prostitution to make ends meet. And over time, she does find work at, with a Russian family in Switzerland. And so Maria and Richard move to Switzerland to live with Maria's new employers. But like so many men before, the master of the house finds Maria absolutely irresistible and the two begin a sexual relationship. Once he gets bored of her, the relationship ends and the mother and child are kicked out once again on the streets. Maria eventually meets a Jewish businessman and they begin a relationship. And like all good and healthy relationships, this one is based on lies and deceit. Uh, Maria, she couldn't risk her new boyfriend finding out about her history and her Nazi sympathizer past or the fact that she has three children. So once again, she sends Richard away. This time he is sent to live with an aunt in Amsterdam who randomly dies during breakfast within six months of Richard's arrival. Finally at age 11 and after countless traumas, Richard moves back in with his dad, Jacob Klinkhammer, and he is reunited with his two half brothers. His father had remarried since his divorce from Maria. Um, however, it seems that none of the boys actually liked her. She's been described as unstable and nagging and that all three boys had like a really terrible relationship with her. It's also at this time that Richard is finally told the truth about his biological father by his brothers. But Jacob Klinkhammer, he seems to be a really, really good man, and he treats all three of his boys equally and with like a lot of fatherly love. He also provides stability to Richard, something that was really, really lacking from his life all the years that Richard had been like in his mother's care. And although his brothers gamble, trade, and steal, Richard becomes a butcher's apprentice and seemingly tries to make something of himself. But when some money goes missing from the butcher's till, uh, Richard is accused of stealing it. He just, he quits his job and he moves on. At age 18, Richard runs off to France and enlists in the French Foreign Legion, where he serves in Algeria from 1956 to 1960. He doesn't enjoy that work either and he tries to desert his post. He's captured and jailed for a few months and after then he's freed, but then he flees again. And this time he flees to Italy and he makes it home to Amsterdam with his brothers and his father. 
Now Richard, he likes the ladies, and one day he meets a girl named Leontine. Leontine is an only child from a middle class family, and she is smitten with Richard. And despite their very tumultuous relationship, it doesn't matter. And while Leontine is the only child of her biological family, her family did take in a nine-year-old foster child that Leontine grew up with, a foster sister who she considered to be her actual sister. Richard and Leontine are on and off, on and off for a while, but when Leontine is 22 and Richard is 25 years old, they discover that she is pregnant. So Richard proposes to her and they get married. They would eventually have two sons together. But their marriage is not a very happy one. Richard eventually tells Leontine that he has fallen in love with her foster sister. And not wanting to lose her husband, Leontine agrees to have a sort of three-way marriage with her husband and her foster sister, whereby he gets to sleep with both of them, but like not at the same time. You know, he chooses which, which woman he wants to be with uh, on which day. So yeah, all three of them live together for a period of about three months until they realize that that's not gonna work out. Um, so that doesn't last, and in 1977, Richard and Leontine divorce. Now let's turn our attention to Hannelore, Hani, Hodfrinon, and her childhood. Hani's parents had a very violent and tumultuous relationship as well, and her father would frequently abuse her mother physically. Um, on July 15th, 1957, they had an altercation which ended up with her father throwing her mother down the stairs. But that wasn't quite enough. So he grabbed a hammer and he beat her until he was sure that his wife was dead. And Honey was nine years old at the time and it was also Honey who came home from school and she found her mother lying in a pool of blood at the bottom of the staircase. Her father was nowhere to be found and he just disappeared, never to be seen or heard from again. Since Honey was just a small child, she was fostered by a kind middle-class family who had their own daughter named Leontine. Yes, the Leontine who married Richard. The Leontine who shared her husband with her foster sister. If you haven't figured it out, the foster sister was Honey. Okay, she was Honey. And that is how she and Richard met. Now let's take another short break while we digest that information. Honey was completely obsessed with Richard. She thought that he was entertaining and he was funny and she told all of her friends that she would eventually marry him, even though he was actually 10 years older than her. Anyways, as I had mentioned, Honey was in love with Richard from the start and it was her goal to marry him. She had also hoped to start a life with him in the town of Hansadijk. In 1978, promptly after his divorce with Leontine, Richard and Hani married and they did just that. They moved to Hansadijk and started a new life together. In the beginning, everything seemed wonderful. They had a lovely and active social life. Honey worked as a nurse in the children's ward of a hospital in Vinsholte, and Richard, he made a lot of money from the options exchange. He was generous with Honey, letting her buy like whatever she wanted, and she enjoyed that for sure. Um, in addition, Klinkhammer's writing career began to take off during their marriage, and Richard achieved like a modicum of fame. His first book, Obedient Like a Dog, drew heavily on his experiences in the French Foreign Legion. In it, he wrote, the first thing they teach you is how to kill somebody. The second, how to dispose of a body properly. He later had a collection of short stories published entitled Hotel Red. So things are great, right? Well, Things took a turn for the worst in 1987 when the stock market crashed and Richard lost all of his money, all of it, including any savings that they had. So from there, Richard started drinking heavily and from drinking, he escalated to beating Honey. And when he did, she would go and she would stay with her friends. She did not 
She did not keep it a secret that Richard was prone to violent, drunken outbursts and that she was often the target of those violent outbursts. On January 31st, 1991, Honey left home to go to the store and buy a few things. And according to Richard, she never came back. On February 5th, 1991, Richard reported his wife's disappearance to police. He told police that she had gone to the shops on January 31st, but had never come home, and that he had found her red bicycle at a nearby train station. Hmm, that's suspicious. Heine's friends, however, they were already convinced that Richard had killed her, um, and her friend and colleague, Yanni Berghammer, she said that Richard really did not even try to look for her. Investigators spoke with people who knew Honey, and they told authorities about um, the married couple's violent quarrels. And Richard, of course, became the number one suspect in her disappearance. Police questioned Richard several times, and they searched the couple's home and their garden extensively, even using sniffer dogs and eventually even infrared aerial scanning was done by the Royal Dutch like military but nothing was ever found. And so however strong the authorities' suspicions were, there could not be a murder inquiry without a body. And so without a body and without any evidence, Richard was let go. And he just continued on with his life, living in the home that he had shared with Honey. In May, 1991, just three short months after his wife of 13 years disappeared, Richard began working on a new novel that he titled Woensdag Gegatendag, or Mincemeat Wednesday. Within that same year, Richard would take the completed manuscript to his publisher. This novel was about a man who finds condoms in the septic tank at his house and thus finds out that his wife is uh, cheating on him. So, as one would, he just decides to murder her. And then the, ba the book basically includes a list of seven absolutely horrifying methods that he could have used to kill his wife. The most gory of which was destroying Honey's body by pushing her corpse through a meat grinder and then feeding the bits to pigeons. Richard's publisher, Donker, he was not only horrified by this manuscript, but then he also became suspicious and he even asked point blank whether Richard had actually murdered his wife. And Richard's response was, it's not yet the time to talk about it. Hmm. The publisher, Donker, he rejected the manuscript because it was too morbid, um, but he did advise Richard to expand on one section of the disturbing manuscript, which resulted in his third novel, Ransom, which is about an art heist. However, word about Klinkhammer's suspicious book proposal soon got out to the public, mostly among the local press. The gossip resulted in Richard being invited for television interviews, including one on the program about like eccentric figures called Birds of Paradise. And when the show's host asked Richard whether he had killed his wife, he replied, like very casually, it could be. The villagers say I cut her into pieces or I put her in the pond. Klinkhammer also fueled the rumors himself. He also said things like, everyone is able to murder someone somewhere, suddenly. And once he even dug a hole in his garden and he pointed it out to his neighbors um, and he would say like, hey, that's big enough for a person's body. So obviously Richard loves all of this attention and press and living freely. Six years pass. We are now in 1997 and Richard decides that he wants to move back to Amsterdam. Now, the house that he and Honey shared was in Honey's name, and he couldn't sell it um, without her. So Richard hired a lawyer to have her legally pronounced dead in order to sell the house which had been in her name. Then he took the money and he moved to Amsterdam and he began to collect a widower's pension. A fucking pension <laughs> as a widower. And I just I just can't with that. Like, <laughs> what? And not only that, but he moved to Amsterdam with his new girlfriend, 
35 years his junior. And in case you need a quick math breakdown, in 1997, Richard was 60 years old, which makes his girlfriend 25. And I'm just gonna leave that there. So together, these two surfaced on the literary party circuit where Richard was clearly enjoying his position as a minor cult figure among crime writers. A journalist even described Richard as spooky and said that he was really working with the fear of people. He made a lot of jokes about dark things and death. So it seems that Richard was having the time of his life and like living it up. Three years later, in the year 2000, the new owners of Richard and Hani's former house, um, they decided that they wanted to spruce it up a bit, as you do. You know, they want to paint the walls and maybe put in a new kitchen and, you know, that's what you do when you get a new house, okay? But what they really wanted was to fix up the huge, huge garden and they wanted to renovate it, like, from zero. So they hired a crew to dig up all the old stuff and remove the old garden shed so that they could just start fresh. Lo and behold, when they were demolishing the garden shed's concrete floor, they came across something unexpected. They found a skull and then eventually an entire skeleton, which forensic scientists would very soon confirm belonged to Honey. And not only did they find Honey's remains, but buried with her was a small glass jar. And it turns out that that jar contained like newspaper clippings about her disappearance. Shortly thereafter, and I even read accounts saying that it was on the same day, um, the authorities arrested Richard, finally. <laughs> and according to his own account of those events, on January 31st, 1991, he had beat his wife to death with a wrench before he buried her underneath the shed. He used compost to disguise the smell of rotting flesh. And yeah, there you go. While he waited for his trial um, from his jail cell in Utrecht, um, Richard told People Magazine that the couple had gotten into a nasty argument on the night that he had killed her. And he claimed that Honey had grabbed a wrench and they began to wrestle. From that moment, I don't remember much. She hit my hand, we wrestled, and came to the back door. That's where it happened. She was yelling and screaming. She never stopped screaming. It's haunting me still, according to Richard. Now, if his account can be trusted, when Honey was killed on January 31st, 1991, she was 43, just three years younger than her own mother when she also was brutally murdered by her own husband. Richard was sentenced to seven years in prison for his wife's murder, but was later released in 2003 after only two years for good behavior. You heard that right. The man who brutally murdered his wife and then buried her wrote a fucking book about seven ways that he would have killed her, having her pronounced dead so that he could sell her house and collect a widower's pension, okay? This man, this man, who then went on to live his best life with his girlfriend, 25 years old, he served two years in prison. Now, speaking about a book, you might recall that the publisher, he had refused to publish it originally because of how gruesome and horrifying it was, right? Like I, I mentioned that earlier. Well, things changed. And in 2007, after Richard is out of prison, his manuscript of Wunstach Chachatach is published. So once again, Richard profits off the murder of his wife. And in January of 2016, at age 78, while living as a free man, Richard decides to end his own life. So that, my friends, is the very sad tale of Richard and Honey Klinkhammer. I don't want to downplay the absolutely horrific childhood that Richard endured and all of the hate and rape and murder and death and trauma that he was exposed to. However, I think that that can never justify what he did. In the States, we have this expression that domestic crimes of crimes of passion can happen in like the heat of the moment, right? But writing a book about seven additional fantasies on how you might have committed that crime, that's not 
the heat of the moment. Collecting the pension of the person you murdered, not heat of the moment. So I personally am left a bit angry and a bit disgusted after this story because it just, it doesn't feel like justice was served for Honey. Richard became a well-known author. He had a nice career, a hot young girlfriend. And after Honey's body was found, he only served two years, two, two no, that's four, two years in prison. So I want to know, what do you think about this story and the outcome? Do you think it was fair? Um, let, let me know. Thank you guys so much for coming over today and solving this case with me. I really, really appreciate it. And I will see you in the next one. Doei!